Today I want to talk about building great sounding mobile DJ systems. I'm not talking about budget stuff, I'm not talking about ultra high end stuff, I'm talking about that stuff in the middle that just sounds great especially if you set it up right. I'm talking about wedding receptions, corporate events, things like that. For school dances it's a little different but the same principles will apply to most of this. When I'm shopping for DJ speakers the first thing I do is rule out any company that only focuses on making budget speakers. I'm not interested in anything they have to offer. What I try to do is look at companies that make a budget line and they also do big touring rigs because there's always something cool in the middle. Let me give you an example. Take Ford for example. Ford makes this car and they also make this one. Now if you own the car I showed in the last picture, I'm not picking on it. I'm sure it was a great value. It gets you back and forth to work and it does what it's supposed to do problem is it's nothing special. It's a budget car and it's not something you want to roll up to a wedding reception in. We're rolling up to wedding receptions every week so we need something a little nicer than that. So where in the middle do you go? Typically I like to go a couple of steps above the budget. In FBT's case it was the Pro Max. Now I went with the Pro Max 10A because of the weight and the power but I don't recommend going with a 10, believe it or not, unless you are a disabled person like myself. I got the 10 because of its weight and its power, and sometimes I have to put a sub on it. I would actually recommend a 12 to most mobile DJs who are doing weddings and things like that. Why? Well, it's less expensive than a 15. A lot are tempted to go with a 15, but don't do it on some of this nicer stuff. And the reason I say that is because the 12 produces typically a better mid bass than a 15 does. It just has something to do with physics and I don't fully understand it because I'm not that smart. I'm using all active speakers now. I don't mess with anything passive. It's a lot of work. The active stuff has come so far. I'm a believer. I'm a converter. As of about five years ago, I wouldn't go back to passive if you paid me. But when you're looking at passive speakers and you're considering stepping up a little more, be mindful of what the RMS or program is of each component of your top cab. I'm talking about this horn up here. These can get aggressive if you're not careful. I picked up a pair of speakers a while back. I thought I really had something cool. 500 watt RMS to the horn. I thought, wow, this is going to sound great. They were too harsh and the throw was way too far for the typical mobile DJ crowd. I took them out to one gig and it was a big room with a lot of people in it they were still too aggressive. I used them one time, they're collecting dust over here. So usually about, I don't know, anywhere from, believe it or not, 50 watts all the way up to maybe 350 watts, that's probably pretty good for your average wedding. Let's take a minute and talk about subwoofers. Now for most wedding DJs, this isn't something you're always going to particularly need, especially if you have a really good 12 inch top cabinet. But if you do feel you need a subwoofer, consider this. A smaller sub has a shorter throw than a bigger sub. Well, what does that mean? If I brought an 18 inch subwoofer to a wedding reception of 150 people, the bass really wouldn't mature until it got to the back of the room where grandma's sitting. Now you're gonna rattle her dentures out. It's gonna sound great back there, but on the dance floor, it may be lacking. If you go with a smaller sub, the bass is gonna be closer to the dance floor the hot spot for that bass. And that's where you want it. So if you're doing school dances or something like that, yeah, pull off those 18 inch subwoofers for those big gymnasiums. But if you're doing wedding receptions, consider something a little smaller. Now here's the cool thing about subwoofers. If you step into a subwoofer, it doesn't matter what size it is, most active subwoofers have what you call a built-in low pass filter and high pass filter capabilities. Now what this means is, no frequencies below whatever you set it out, usually about 100 hertz, are going to go into the sub. So it's all going to be that boom, 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 that cool bass. And the signal that the subwoofer sends out to the top cab, because it all links in, you run your cable from your mixing board to your sub, from your sub to your top cab, that's going to get crossed over too. It's going to get a high pass filter of 100 hertz. That means that the speaker in your top cab isn't going to have to work as hard. It's only going to have to worry about frequencies from 100 hertz and up. It's going to have better punchy mid bass with 
that high pass filter. If none of that made sense, I'm sorry. I'll try to do a dedicated video to this later. Just take my word for it. Your top caps are gonna light up when you add a sub. Now just a quick word on audio cable. Back in the old days when we were running passive systems, it was kind of a big deal because we were running a strong current from the amplifier to the speaker. But now that we're using active speakers, all we're doing is running a signal from the mixing board or MIDI controller to the speakers. Kind of like a microphone cable, it's the same thing, it's an XLR audio cable. Now there's some super cheap stuff out there. There's some super expensive stuff out there. What do you get? I go middle of the road, but I definitely go something that has a Nutrik plug on it. You can see it says Nutrik right on it. These are good plugs, they're not going to fail on you. Typically something with a Nutrik plug on it is going to have a pretty decent cable on it, and it's going to be plenty good for our purposes. So let's say you've selected the speakers you want, and they're really nice speakers. You're all ready to go now, right? Wrong. Let's talk about the audio chain for a minute. Think about a metal chain. Every link is made of metal, it's very strong. Now let's talk about the audio chain. What's that? That's everything from your speakers, to your MIDI controller or mixing board, to your sound card, to your computer, to the program you use, to the audio files you use. Your audio system is only as strong as its weakest link. So to make your audio system strong, every link has to be pretty good. If you've got one weak link in there, you're gonna screw it all up. It doesn't matter how good your speakers are or how good your mixing board is or anything else. So we gotta do it right all the way through. Next up, let's look at MIDI controllers and mixing boards. So yeah, I'm a Pioneer guy. For this video today, we're using the mixer in the console, which is a DJM750. The reason I go Pioneer is because, well, they sound fantastic. They have great outputs. They've got great kills on the EQ. They've got a fantastic built-in sound card. Even on the midline stuff like this, the 750 is half the price of the 850. Doesn't have all the bells and whistles, but I think it's probably pretty close in sound card and output. But get whatever you want. Be prepared to spend probably, I don't know, between $750 and up for a decent mixer or MIDI controller. Let's talk about your audio source for a minute. If you're using turntables, great. Just go ahead and run your turntables into your mixer. Be sure to ground them and enjoy your records. If you're using CDs, CDs are excellent sound quality. Don't worry about a thing. Just run your CD player RCAs into your mixer and enjoy your CDs. However, if you're like most people these days and you're using a computer, you're using audio files and some kind of program to play those audio files on. Do not, I repeat, do not use a Winamp, do not use iTunes or anything like that. You're going to want to use a computer program that supports ASIO sound cards, which is what's in your MIDI controllers and your nice mixing boards with the built-in sound card. Right now, that's the best you're going to get as far as a sound card built into a DJ style mixing board or MIDI controller. So again, your software needs to support this ISAO sound card capability. Now let's talk about audio files. There are a lot of different audio files out there. And for me, I use MP3s at 320K. Is that the best? No, it's not the best, but it's what we've been using. It's what's available in most of our record pools. You can use WAV files, which are fantastic, but they're huge, they take up a lot of room, and they're hard to get through music service. You can get them through some download services. I believe Promo only offers WAV files, but most of the time, most people use MP3s. If you're gonna use MP3s, use a good quality MP3, make sure that MP3 is a 320K. So now that we've put all of this together, what's the weakest link in this system? Well, in what I just showed you, I believe it's probably the 320K MP3 files. We could go wave, that would improve the system. But, you know, if 320K MP3s are our weakest link, I think we're doing pretty good, especially for the mobile DJ crowd. And there's more to this. We have to figure out how to set up the speakers. We also have to know how to properly set up our mixing board or MIDI controller for sound. The weakest link sometimes is the operator in the setup, but I'm going to help you with that in probably the next video on this subject. 
So I hope this gives you an idea of some of the things to think about when you're building a PA system. You don't want the cheapest system in town, you don't need the most expensive system in town, but you need something that sounds nice, decent to the ear, quality, reliable, and in my opinion, the stuff I showed you today should do the trick. So that's it for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Practice and enjoy.